but my name is Penny Pearson and I am a coordinator for distance learning projects here at OTAN and my uh, contact information is on the screen at ppearson at otan.us. You can also call, typically leaving a voicemail message these days at 916-228-2580. I'm happy to help you and we'll kind of go over here what, um, what I've done in my past, a little bit about me before we get started. First and foremost, uh, I told you I was a coordinator, but I'm also an original digital learner um, or what, what was called in the day correspondence school. So um, learning at a distance has been something I'm very familiar with in many different ways. Not only was I a teacher in the classroom for 12 years, I taught career tech ed in um, uh, technologies and computers, etc. And then I've spent the last 13 years here with OTAN. Um, I'm very passionate about the topic we're going to be talking about today. Um, the image you're seeing on this screen is um, what's called a Creative Commons Certificate. And basically, I, I completed a course that says that what I'm going to tell you today, I know what I'm talking about. That's basically it. I will say here, as we continue our conversation, um, I am not a lawyer. So if you want me to answer questions about particular areas of copyright law, I will tell you I am not a lawyer. <laughs> so I can give you my opinion, but you have to take it as such. So let's see what we're supposed to do today. So we're going to talk about the definition of open educational resources. And we're going to talk about licensing. And um, some of you may be very familiar with this. Some of you may have never heard about this before. I am going to make a general assumption that this is a new topic to most of you. So I want to give you an idea of what this looks like. What is this thing that I'm going to talk about a lot, which is called Creative Commons. You just saw that slide previous that had an image of that certificate. I'm going to talk about what we call the open movement. And I have a little short video that we'll watch to describe that for you. We'll also do a little bit of looking around in how to search for open educational resources and I'll demonstrate some sites where you can find additional information about open educational resources. So next we need to look at what are open educational resources. So we need to define them. So I'm going to pause here for just a second and allow you to read this because it's something that um, will define it in your head. I want you to just read it for a second and then I'm going to read it. So just wait just a sec. So open educational resources, OER, are teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits sharing, accessing, repurposing, including for commercial purposes, and collaborating with others. This is a definition that has been around for quite some time. You'll notice this is from the National Educational Technology Plan way back in 2010. And believe it or not, they don't even put this in the National Tech Plan anymore because it's, I guess it's kind of assumed that everybody knows. So we've defined what an OER is, an open educational resource, but what can be an open educational resource? So on this slide, I have several graphic images that represent what can be an open educational resource. That can include things like podcasts and audio files, simulations like science simulations, music can be an open educational resource, um, lesson plans can be an open educational resource in different formats, games can be open educational resources, as well as other applications themselves. Themselves. So these just represent a small portion, but if you can kind of think of anything that can be digitalized, so you might be using something like a, oh, I don't know, maybe a textbook, that could be an open educational resource, okay? So you have to understand that you, it's your responsibility for understanding how things are licensed. And that's what we're going to go into next, okay? So we have lots of things that can be open educational resources, but that does not mean everything we find are open educational resources. So I will ask another question. I just want you to ponder this a minute. If you or your students find something on the web, it is okay to take it 
and use it however they wish. Think about that. Is that a yes or a no answer? Because that makes a big difference when you're teaching as well as when you are creating. So I've seen lots of no's there. That's correct because as we talk about these next slides, you'll see why. Okay, so we've talked about what is an open educational resource, what can be. So now let's talk a little bit about public domain versus open licenses. Public domain is your friend. And Janice, I see your it depends answer. Yes, you are correct. <laughs> um, it is something that you have to be aware of. It depends on purpose and a lot of other things. So this slide represents two circles, public domain versus open license. So public domain in, in our minds for our purposes means that the copyright ownership has been waived by the owner. So the author who created it said, oh, this, I, nope, I give it to the commons. I give it to everyone. You can use it however you wish. You can reproduce it. You can chop it up into little pieces. You can change its colors and you can distribute that however you like. I have no rights, no intellectual property rights to that thing. So I will let you know that every time you create something in our world today with the click of the shutter of your camera, with the strike of your pen on the cocktail napkin at the table with your friends, um, at the thought and process of writing something in an electronic document, those are automatically protected by copyright. That is your intellectual property. You created it. So you've got this idea here that Somewhere in the public domain, there are lots of people who have given up that intellectual property and allowing you as someone who's searching for information to use it however you see fit. Now this is different than what we're calling an open license, okay? The open license means that the copyright ownership is retained, okay? The author is simply granting very broad rights to the public to reproduce and distribute their creative work. So this is a two-way street. So an open license means that I as the creator still own this thing. It could be my photograph. But I determine by my own decision that I will grant rights to anyone who wants to use it with a certain set of criteria, okay? And that's the criteria is what we are going to work on next, okay? What makes something fully open? And this is something that's called the five R's, okay? And we're gonna look at what that is on this next slide of five R's of open. And those five R's are retain, reuse, revise, remix and redistribute. Now, in each one of these, they're basically fairly self-explanatory. Retain means that they're, they're mine, I control the copies, I control the content. I can reuse it in any way that I want to use it. I can use it in a class, a study group, put it on a website, I can put it in a video, I can print it in a book. I can revise it, I can adapt it, I can adjust it, I can modify it, I can change the colors, I can mash it up with something, well that's, that's remix later, but I can change uh, the, the language perhaps. Um, I can remix it, I can mix it with something else. I can kind of do a mashup, so to speak, where I can take that original content or revised content with other materials and make it into something new. That's remixing. I can redistribute it. So I give the right to share copies of that original content, the revisions that I've made, the remixes that I've made with others. So this is like you're giving a copy of whatever you created to someone else. Okay, so we've talked about the definition of open educational resources. We've talked about the difference between public domain and open licensing and the five R's of those licenses, which again are retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. But maybe this whole concept of openness 
might be a little foreign to many of us. So I'm going to play a little video and I want you to just sit back and listen. You don't have to take notes or anything. Uh, just listen to it and see how you, how, how you react to this, okay? So this is a little video on what is an open license. Educational resources are automatically copyrighted when you create them under U.S. copyright law. So let's say that I wrote a textbook, for example. I own that and nobody can use it without my permission. When we openly license that textbook, what we're doing is we're giving a license, we're giving permissions to the public to use that book under the terms of the license. Licenses are a part of the copyright system all around the world. They're used by big companies like when a clothing manufacturer wants to sell a superhero t-shirt. And so licenses are part of the fabric of copyright law. But all of those licenses are negotiated one-to-one. -one. So when a company wants to use a text or a song or a character or part of a movie that belongs to a different rights holder, they have to have their lawyers sit down with the other lawyers and it takes time and money. So adding a Creative Commons license to a work is like saying, hey, this resource is free for you to use however you want. It's the basic Creative Commons license is the CC BY license, or the Creative Commons Attribution license. And that's the most basic Creative Commons license. And all it says is you can use this work, this copyrighted thing, this photograph, this book, this song, if you attribute it to me, the creator. The reason a lot of educators and, and governments more and more are choosing that license is that the only requirement is to give proper attribution to the author, to the original creator. That's really easy to do. It also allows you to remix those works with other openly licensed works in a very easy way. And uh, teachers have always given each other materials and if you know the person you're sharing the materials with, you can give them permission. But when you want to share materials with teachers across the country and potentially teachers across the world, you need a standardized way to do that. And that's what the Creative Commons licenses are. So did that make sense to everyone? What a Creative Commons, what an open license is and how it works? Because we're going to talk about those licenses next. First and foremost, you heard um, these folks talking before from Spark, Cable Green, and others about the licensing. Creative Commons is the licensing source of how we look at content and how we make decisions on both sharing our work and taking other people's work. So in this graphic here, I have, you'll see this little, I'm going to turn on my little annotation right here. This whole section up here, okay, this is your good zone. This is the, the green area. These are the considered the most open licenses. And by that, I mean that they adhere to their five R's that we discussed before. These items down here have some specific restrictions aligned with them that are in um, opposition to the idea of those five R's. So this is something you need to keep an eye out for and we're gonna look at all of the licenses next so you have a way to understand how you um, uh, can find material and understand how they actually are licensed and what the permissions are to use those works themselves yourself so on this particular slide that's coming up next are these are all the license icons that are given by creative commons and you'll notice they're consistent each one of them has pretty much the same um the same uh cc in it i'll just like make the note here this one they all have this in common and they all have this little guy here, or this humanoid fi figure, which is um, what's called attribution. It's giving credit where credit is due. And Danita, when you are asking, I see your question in the Q&A pod, what is closed licensing? That's copyright. 
Copyright says, this is my property. If you want to do anything with it, you have to get my permission. And that's the way it is. So that's the closest thing I would call closed licensing. Okay. And that's through copyright law. So these icons here each represent something different. So the by means attribution and each one of these here means something a little different. And we're going to look at that in the next slide to give an example of all of these different images. Each one means something. So I'll just choose this one right here. I'm going to draw a circle around it at the bottom. It has the letters NC underneath it. And the image itself is a circle with a dollar sign and a slash through it. What do you think that might mean? Think again about SA. What could SA stand for? And the reason why I'm, I'm going to keep harping on this is because this is the way you as a creator have a choice to license your work or you as a user you can know how you can use somebody's work who have licensed it with a Creative Commons license. And I see everybody, I see a few in the chat pod saying NC for no commercial use, you are correct. SA for share alike, you are correct. And here on our next slide is more detail on each of these licenses. And you'll notice on the left hand side, we have all of the icons again, we have two of them that are boxed in green. Green is go, green is good, okay? This is the way that you know that they fall under what the world copyright lawyers say is a free cultural work. They adhere to those five R's that we've talked about before. One thing that is not put in um, this list is public domain because remember, Creative Commons licenses are built upon copyright. They are simply a way for an author to tell a user, this is how you can use my stuff. And it's also a way for um, somebody who wants to share their work that they can make a decision on how they want to license the work. So as you look through here, you'll see that we have the CC by attribution. Can someone use my work to make money? And the answer is yes. And everybody goes, <gasps> Oh my goodness, I don't want that. Absolutely, then you do not license your work that way. How about this one, the SA? We had somebody in the chat pod say, share alike. You are absolutely correct. The trick with share alike is that it, anything that you create must also be licensed as share alike, okay? And that means that you agree to do that when you use this license. Can somebody use my work to make money? Yes. Can somebody change my work? Yes. Remember, open licensing means we are adhering to those five R's. We are allowing people to use our work. You must make the moral and thoughtful decision on how you are going to license your work. So ND means no derivative works. That means you cannot change something. So we'll go over each one of these here. So this next one here I'm going to circle is attribution non-commercial. The by BY means attribution. The NC means non-commercial. Can someone use my work to make money? No, they cannot. Can someone change my work? Yes, they can. So, oh, I see a question in the chat about what does share alike means? It means, Thomas, when you, create, when you take something that has a share alike license, you must also share your work with the same license. So you have to be willing to say, yes, if I take Penny's picture of the polar bear and I turn it purple because my work was, was marked as share alike, then your work that you've created, this new thing that you've created, the purple polar bear, now must be also licensed under a share alike license. So you're agreeing to that fact with that license, okay? So if we move on to the next one, this is the CC by ND. This one here is saying, can someone use my work to make money? They can. They have to give attribution, but they cannot change a thing. So I'll go back to my polar bear. If I was way up north and I took a 
gorgeous photograph of a polar bear. I can share it and say, this is my great photograph. You need to give me credit, but you cannot change this photograph. You cannot make that polar bear purple. That's a derivative work. You have made changes to my stuff. And in, under this license, I'm saying you can't do that. All right. The next one is this CC by NCND, which means attribution, non-commercial, and no derivatives. This is a highly restricted license. It means that they can't use your work to make money and they cannot change your work. That does not mean that there is not value in finding this type of work when you're searching on the web. It is just telling you exactly how you can use that work. Hope we're making sense so far. We're on the last one, which is CC by NC and share alike. So now this means I need to give credit, attribution. I cannot make any money off of it. It's non-commercial, but I also must share it. So if I were to take something off the wherever I find it, I am going to be able to change this work. I can make... Um, derivatives from it. I can take that photograph of my polar bear and I can make it purple, but I cannot sell it and I have to share it. I have to add that same share alike license to this particular Creative Commons license. Each one of these licenses have different values to you as a creator. You have to decide how do you want others to use your work? You have to decide when you find other materials online, you should always look for how is this work licensed? Okay. Um, I think I see something here. Can you add an NC to a CC by SA? Well, that's down here. Um, again, it is, Janice, it is a personal choice. Um, I personally know that if I was a terrific photographer, then I would probably have another website where I would sell my photographs. It may not be the same exact polar bear photo, but I may have one that I'm like, eh, it's okay. It's not National Geo quality, so I'm going to release it under a share and share alike, or I'm going to release it under an attribution license. Um, I have to make that moral decision that I don't care that somebody uses my work for commercial purposes because I can guarantee you that that whole process is very cumbersome <laughs> to do. And honestly, there is no easy way right now to track unless you want to be very obsessive and compulsive of like, okay, who's using my stuff? Um, and some people do want to know that and there's no real easy way um, other than there are mechanisms within the licensing itself that can help you to find your work on the internet okay there's lots of little tools that happen on the internet that can help you find materials so we're going to talk next about the whole creation process okay the creation process is very personal right we all use different tools to create. You might use Microsoft Word, you might use OpenOffice, you might be using Google Docs, you might be using a notepad. All of those things by virtue of your creation are protected under copyright law. You make the decide, you have to make the decision of what permissions you want to give other people to use your work. So from here, I'm going to switch off onto the internet and show you how you can license your work. And then we're going to move on to a, a quick um, discussion. So the question earlier about where do you find it? It's a big old fat, it depends, but I'll show you ways that you can look for it, okay? Creativecommons.org is your all knowing everything about the open movement. Um, how to share your work, 
and where to find other resources. So I'm on creativecommons.org, and if one of my helpers can type that into the chat pod, that would be handy. I do not recommend that you go out there just yet. Just follow along with me for a moment, because on this website, I'm going to choose this link that says share your work. And under this page, there is a lot of information here about some information coming from their blog posts. You're going to see a lot now of how uh, many schools um, and corporations are leveraging um, open educational resources in order to help in different um, sections of industry, business, and education. But you'll also see a whole section here on how to help you choose a license. All right, so this gives me um, a, a really easy way to say, okay, yeah, um, give me the couple of steps to create my license. So I'm going to scroll down the page and choose this button that says get started. And this is going to start that process where I'm going to make some decisions. First and foremost, I have some information here that maybe I want to read these considerations before licensing. So there are several links on this page that maybe can help explain things uh, in more detail, uh, maybe with a little more clarity than what you've received from this short little webinar today. Um, you can learn more about public domain and you can get additional information on how these licenses have evolved over time. So this box that says license features, this is where you start asking or answering questions. So first and foremost, this is always the one that people are like, well, I don't know, allow adaptations of your work to be shared. Now there's three radio buttons here, yes, no, and yes, as long as others share alike. There is a difference in these licenses and we'll go through and I'll show you how that works. So I'm gonna say yes, they can share my work. This is, I'm saying, this is allowed. And if I choose yes here under commercial uses of your work, I get a license that is CC BY. You see the two icons here, this two C's in the circle and the small humanoid image. And below that, I see that it's marked as a free cultural license. I know that this license is allowing and following and adhering to the whole concept of open and following the five R's that we spoke to before. So if I choose no, don't allow commercial uses of my work, ah, I get the message. Now, this is not a free cultural work because it doesn't uh, follow those original five R's. And the main one is this little circle with the dollar sign and the slash because I'm not allowing commercial uses for my work. So I'm going to change this back. And I'm going to scroll down the page to there's a section called help others attribute you. Now this is optional, but it's very nice because it can help in finding other works and help you find your own works. Right now, I have this section that says have a web page and I can copy this code that is listed here or I can simply copy this text and the graphic icon here and paste it into my Word document or I can copy the code and I can paste it into my web page. So I'm telling others very easily how my stuff can be used. Now, if I choose this help others attribute you, I'm going to click this link about it's optional, but it allows you to add more information. So I could put in the title of my work OER for adult education. I can attribute the work to my name. And I can say, you can attribute it to my organization that I work for. And I could put in a source work URL if say this was a photo off of a web page, or I could put in another resource or a URL where they could ask for additional permissions. And you'll notice under the have a web page that this changed. Now I see more information and they're all hyperlinked. So when I said that my name was attributable to my URL of OTAN.us, this will, my name now links me to OTAN.us. The other links here 
link me directly to what's called the license language. So when I do that, if I click on this, it tells me this is true when you maintain those links, when you copy that text and paste it into your Word document, it tells individuals who want to use your work exactly how they can use that work. Now, there are three layers to licensing. This is what we call the plain English version. Okay, this means that anybody who reads this, they should understand how that work can be done. There are other notices that apply with this license. One of them is called machine readable metadata. And that's all of the information that says exactly what the license is, what the terms are, etc. And you don't read that per se but they're in the programming of these licenses. So this gives you additional information on this page and it tells you you can also get it in different languages and you'll also note in the earlier question before it says where do you find these icons? Many times you find them like right what we're seeing here is down at the bottom of the page but I will guarantee you that is not an everyday thing. It doesn't happen. So I have licensed my work I have said that I will allow anybody to copy and redistribute it. They can remix it, they can transform it, they can build upon it for any purpose, even commercially, because I made that decision. Now, a lot of you are going, oh, no, 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 no. I would never let anybody, mm -mm -mm. and that is absolutely okay. It is up to you how you want to license your work. No, Angela, you say, does this cost money as some point? to CC. No, this does not cost money, but they are a nonprofit organization and they will ask for donations. Um, so that is something that does come up. Um, I have contributed to them because I use their resources all the time. So that is a personal choice as well if you want to contribute to them as a nonprofit organization. But there is no cost to going in and using that tool and licensing your own work. Okay, can I reuse material on the web if there is no copyright notice? The answer is all things on the web are copyrighted. Okay, unless there is a notice that says it is not. This is that close licensing. I think there was a question of how, you know, what well, well, okay, is there such a thing? Yes, it's copyright law. You must make the assumption that all things on the internet are copyrighted. This is something you need to convey to your learners. They cannot go out and grab a picture of Mickey Mouse and think that they can slap it on their PowerPoint presentation and post it on Facebook, okay? It's just, don't do it. I've, I have an example of a teacher who years ago was using this for a class website. Um, learners were creating um, remedies, folk remedies that they knew from their home countries. They were grabbing images all over the internet and it is a problem. They actually got a um, cease and desist order. Angela asked, can we Creative Commons license any work? Yes, you can. How do we actually find stuff is coming up. Um, Angela, videos, Google Docs, sheets, or slides, do you mean licensing them or do you mean finding them? If you mean licensing, yes, you can create your own license and you can assign a, um, a Creative Commons license to it. Uh, Jennifer, gr government stuff is generally not copyrighted. It is under public domain or a Creative Commons license. And I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. Uh, finding extensive free use materials. Thomas, we will look at those in the next slide. Okay. Is there a copyright jail? <laughs> um, I think that's all a matter of perspective. Most of the time people are very responsive to a cease and desist order. <laughs> um, because with the web, the World Wide Web, we are all interconnected. And that means it's very easy for someone to write a little particular program. And this is what people like Shutterstock and Getty Images and Disney and some of these guys that create, you know, National Geographic, they create these tools that go on the World Wide Web and they just scan the web. They go looking for their stuff. Do you remember earlier in the licensing when we were choosing the licensing tool? I said that this was the English version of the license. It made it very easy to understand how something could be used. And I said there's a secondary layer called the metadata. 
That is the stuff that these little bots go after. They're little spider bots. I have a little program in them and they're looking for that metadata. That means this is my property and it's on somebody else's website. You stop that. You are not allowed to do that unless you gain permission or you purchase it. Okay. So our Pixabay images in the public domain, you need to read the license. And we'll go and look at those. Pixabay is one of my favorites. Um, can we use the OTAN webinars materials to teach online? Alicia, if they have been licensed as such, of course you can. This particular resource that I'm showing you is fully licensed under Creative Commons. All that I ask is that you give me credit. All right, so let's move on. We've got what here? Only about 15 minutes. So let's look at some resources. Um, I'm going to show you these tools. On this slide, I'm talking about um, these are some resources. This is by far not all, but I want to give you the tools. There's that proverb, teach a man or woman to fish. They can feed themselves forever. That's what I want to try to do. I want to show you resources where you can find materials that you can use. You must make the decision and do your own due diligence to make sure that they meet your needs. Just like you would with any textbook, you should be looking at, is this really what I want? All right, so I'm going to switch over here to my uh, web page and we're going to look first at Google Advanced Search. I bet you didn't know that there was a Google Advanced Search because most of you probably put in keywords and just go, oh, I'm done. Don't do that anymore because in advanced search, and it's just google.com slash advanced underscore search. This allows you to put in keywords like you normally do. We just put it in the search bar in Google and we get 5 million hits. Okay, I don't have time to do that. So under advanced search, I have all of these options. So I can choose what language I want it to be in. I can choose when it was updated. So I really like this stuff that's in the past year when I'm doing research. Okay, um, do I want to find it somewhere in the page or anywhere in the page? Do I want to choose a certain file type? So I'm, maybe I'm looking for only PDFs, maybe I'm only looking for Microsoft Word documents or rich text. I can choose the format. This is the key one right here, usage rights. By default, Google does not filter by license. So if you drop this down, you can choose free to use to share, free to use or share even commercially, free to use or share modify, free to use or share modify even commercially. You can choose what you want. And then you have to filter through all of the results, okay? And I would encourage you to experiment and use your keywords critically of what you want to find and why you want to find it. And when you click that search, you're then going to see all of the different results. So if you don't want to search through Google, because I'm sorry, this is Google's great. It's wonderful. It's the biggest search engine on the planet, but it is not real friendly to finding resources that may or may not fit your needs, whether you want to repurpose something, revise it, remix it, or whether you just want something that is free to use, but is still under copyright rules. So then we're going to go look at something called OER to go. This is from an organization that I truly love called World Possible. This organization has all of these packets where they have taken a snapshot of the World Wide Web at any point in time. So this website, oer2go.org, allows you to find things like uh, listed on this page. You see all of these blocks that will give you information about these resources. They are all open educational resources. So some of you may know here in California, Algebra to Go. They're out of Saddleback in um, uh, the Bay Area. And you can see right away, Creative Commons, Attribution, Share Alike. That's right. So all you need to do is give Saddleback credit for this Algebra to Go packet and you can use it. You can download it. You can read more about it through these websites here. Okay, they give you a preview down at the bottom. So they have addition and subtraction. If you want conversions, you can go and preview this on oer2go.org. Now, what this is, is these are shared content materials. And in some cases, they are a website that has been captured and one 
at one point in time. So they've gone in and they've basically um, taken a copy of a website. So on Career Girls or CK12, CK12 is another fa fa favorite one of mine. And that when I open this up, do you see this license? What does this license mean? CC, BY, and then NC. What is that telling you of how you can use this material? These are full-on textbooks. No commercial use, exactly. You cannot take one of these textbooks that is a STEM textbook from sixth grade through high school and turn around and sell it. Okay, they say, nope, can't do it. But you can come in and explore these. And if you have um, students that need some help with chemistry or they need some help with calculus, okay, um, you'll see here that some of these books have a teacher's edition that you can download and they are yours to take and use under the conditions of the license, which is, as we saw up here, let me scroll back up, it is attribution non-commercial. So again, this is on the oer to go website. You can look at all of these. I'm gonna scroll through the page very quickly. There's, there's um, each of these tiles represents a different um, set of resources. So you might like the college credit courses. You might like um, Edison Robotics. Maybe you have a robotics program at your site. Um, there's several of him here. Um, Fair Shake Reentry Resource Center. This is a great resource for folks that are on parole or coming out of a jail or corrections program. Um, there's GCF. Some of you may use GCF Learn Free. They've downloaded that site back in 2015, but the resources are still wonderful to use. Feed the Monster, Great Books of the World, Who Doesn't Know About Khan Academy? Okay, so all of these things are resources you can download and use. Okay, that's under OER to go. I'm going to show you one that's a little closer to home in California. This is from the California State University. It's called Cool for Ed. And this is an open online library for education. You can see here, I'm scrolling down this page showing you how to find, they have different tiles for finding materials, showcases about how they're using it. They're looking for other, if you're looking for other information about um, the Textbook uh, Affordability Act, they have resources here where you can browse through all of these things and determine if they are useful for you. So if I were to go and choose maybe showcase and well, let's see if something looks interesting here. Let's go to OER resources and see. You see how you do have to spend some time looking and approving and seeing whether or not these are useful. So they have some resources here um, about entering keywords so you can find materials. Um, they even have availability on smartphones and tablets. So you can see here that they have um, a folder. This is a federal grant here, this AB 798 slash TACC resources. There is, I believe, thousands of resources here. And if you are from a community college or one of the um, state universities in California, UCs, you may want to check this out because a lot of the campus coordinators have contributed to this and made it available for learners. At the top of the page, across the top, you'll see that there's a course showcase. There's information and resources on career and technical education. For those of you that have um, Career Tech Ed, uh, this is a great place to look. And the question in the, um, in the Q&A from Denise is asking about anything good for teaching low level ESL. Back on OER to go, there is a, um, I just switched to OER to go, there is a phonics class. Let's see, mustard seed books are also a good one. And uh, I'm trying to find it here. I'm sorry I'm scrolling and it's hard on your eyeballs. But there are a couple of items in here for phonics and reading. Uh, you just might have to look through it and see if it meets your needs um, because that is something that is uh, very, um, comes up a lot, okay? Another um, resource that is near and dear to my heart is oercommons.org. So this website is oercommons, 
www.ncpsf.org. So let me go in and show you at least the groups because this is something I'm very proud of because on featured groups, this one is the Adult Education Open Community of Resources. And there have been, I think we're upwards of a couple of hundred resources that have been added here. And there are a lot for um, ESL. So that's an option that you can look at here, create an account. And um, later on, I'm hoping to do another webinar about how you can use OER Commons to create and license your own materials using their tool called Open Author free online textbooks. This is CK12. Remember, we saw that under OER to go, but this is the, the updated current web page. So if you want some uh, additional textbooks, you can look here. You might find more information, including um, instructional videos, short stories, things like that that can help you um, teach about your topic. You will have to go in and either look under by subject or um, use keywords to search with. It does have options of looking um, here under the topic. I'm using this little drop down list next to the um, search box that allows you to pick the topics. Um, and there are many, many others because we've only got a couple of minutes left here. So I'm going to go to another website that is um, out of Utah. It's Mountain Heights Academy. And this is a fully OER run textbook, materials, et cetera, website, um, academy, um, high school. It was usually, it was called the Open High School of Utah, and now they've changed their name. But this is a place that you can look at their resources, and you can go in and find their materials. And do you see the license here on this page? Okay, do you see the license? How can you use this material? You still have to do your due diligence. You still have to check the license. You still have to make sure that, that you can use it the way you want to use it. So, uh, Melissa, Anna, you say, would you just put the credit in a prominent place on what you do or what you give the student? And that's credit. Um, yes, technically, that works fine. Um, this is a what's called, a, you know, your attribution needs to include four things. And if you want to stay beyond the initial hour, I will show you how that works. It's called tassel, title, author, source, and license. So those are things that you can keep in mind as when you want to give credit, title, author, source, and license. So that way they know who did it, what the title of the work is, where they got it from, and what the license is. Share alike, attribution only, non-commercial, no derivatives, all of those things would be in that license, okay? Remember when we did the license over under um, choose a license? I have all of that information right here. What's the, the it says this work. If I put the work in here, as the title of the work, OER for Adult Ed. Now, why didn't that show up? It should have showed up right here. The OER for Adult Education would show up here, and I would have the title, author, source, and license. So I have to figure out why that didn't show up. At any rate, hopefully that this general idea of finding these resources, um, I'm going to go through a couple of others really quickly um, one here is um, a resource from ISTE. If you are not familiar with ISTE, um, as an educator, I encourage you to become involved and look at their website. You can see here that they have um, OER publications, things that they have done white papers on and interviews, and they license their work under Creative Commons. So you can download this particular um, paper. You can redistribute it. If you wanted to, you can hack it up into smaller pieces and use it for teaching an opportunity, et cetera. So you see quite clearly here the license on that work. So we've done choose a license. The next thing I want to go to here is something that I think is really important to us as instructors, and that is this new law. If you are not familiar with it, it won't have a huge impact on us immediately because this was actually um, a couple of years ago that it got started. But there is new rules out now that when we create materials, um, especially if we're funded with public monies, they should be licensed 
under a Creative Commons license. There should be some open license to allow us access, okay? And this is something I think is really good for adult education and any agency that's funded by public funds. Um, we will post this presentation so you will have access to it. And one of the things that I do try to do is always practice what I preach. This presentation is openly licensed. You are free to take it and a copy of it and you can share it with your peers and know that all that I would ask that you do is you give me credit for creating it. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and end the session and um, we will, I will stick around if you want additional questions. We'll put up the slide here showing you our um, website and all of the things that OTAN offers and our social media. If you have not already subscribed, we encourage you to do so. And thank you all for those of you that have attended. And I'll go ahead and end this first hour and we'll continue the discussion if you so choose. Thank you. So um, this is for Guillermo and anybody else who's looking for um, information on uh, low-level literacy. This website is Teach the World to Read, and um, this is, um, I haven't explored it fully, so, you know, if you find problems with it, let me know. But this is a program that allows, let me zoom in because I know this text is small. So this is a reading program that's distributed around the world. Um, so as you can see on the site, I'm scrolling through and it's just information about fun, fantastic phonics. Um, so they give you storybooks, they give you downloadable and printable um, information that you can use locally or you can use it digitally. Um, they have training guides and then they also have a lot of stuff um, digital. And um, you can download materials and we've, uh, they've also allowed for uh, the World Possible site where I was at before that OER to go, I believe, um, and I just didn't see it on that list, but that Fantastic Phonics is included on that OER to go site. So this is a place where um, you can really help with that really low literacy um, understanding, you know, decoding of sounds and recognizing letters and things like that. And I, I believe that this would be a really good resource. Um, and uh, Guillermo, if you try it out, let me know, okay? Because I, like I said, I haven't had a chance to figure it out yet. Rita, you asked, is fin Fantastic Phonics geared towards children or adults? It's definitely geared toward children. Um, so you are going to have to do your due diligence to see if the materials are too, what I call butterflies and bubblegum. Um, so that's something that, you know, you as a teacher still need to look for it, but because of the way that they're licensed, you can scaffold the work if you need to or modify it as you need. Uh, Cheryl, what about when students do podcasts and videos? How do they give attribution if they're using music or photos of others? Okay, here's the easiest way. They just say so, okay? Um, I listen to CC um, podcasts all the time. And I listen to um, books on audiobooks that are Creative Commons licensed. And at the end of every chapter or every section, every uh, podcast itself, it says this work is, is created by blah, 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 and is licensed under Creative Commons 2.0 attribution license. So it's telling the people that are using this work how that work is licensed. For photographs and things like that, um, I'm going to bring up my PowerPoint. It's a, it's a matter of that whole, what I called tassel before. So here's my, my slide, and I'm going to say add a photo with attribution, okay? Now, somebody asked earlier about Pixabay, right? Does anybody else have a, a favorite picture site that they like? I think it's .com, isn't it? I always forget. Stunning free images, royalty free. Oh, wow, this looks great. So remember I talked about polar bears before, right? Now, on this page, do you see a lot of pictures? <laughs> Here's the thing that gets people, and it gets your students too. At the top, they have these sponsored images. That means you're going to pay for them in one way or the other. So we need to look down here. So I like this one, polar bear Arctic snoozing away. If I click on that image, 
I'm going to get a lot more information about this image. So I see over here it says free download. Mm. And then I see underneath it free for commercial use, no attribution required. Well, now wait a second. Uh, is this legal? I can click on Pixabay license and I can read exactly what I can do with their images. Okay, what is allowed? It can be used for free or commercial, non commercial use across print and digital, except in the cases mentioned in what is not allowed. That's down here at the bottom. What is not allowed? Attribution is not required. How nice. Some of us might be a little lazy, right? Giving credit to the Contributor or Pixabay is not necessary, but it's always appreciated by our community. I always give credit. It's only good manners, right? Give credit where credit is due. So now it says don't redistribute or sell someone else's Pixabay images or videos on other stock or wallpaper platforms. Don't sell unaltered comment, uh, copies of an image like sell an exact copy of a stock photo as a poster print or on a physical product. Don't so you can't take my polar bear and print it on a t-shirt and sell it. Don't portray identifiable people in a bad light or a way that is I've offensive. That's just good manners. Don't use images with identifiable brands to create misleading associations with a product or service. So if I see a picture of a particular coffee shop, I can't go in there and make it look like, you know, something bad. So this is Pixabay's license. Is it understandable? I think so. I go back to that page. And what I need to do is if I do this free download, I can choose what type of image I want. I can select a big one or a small one and then click the download button. And on my computer, um, it will download into my downloads folder. So I tell them I'm not a, I'm not a robot. I'll download the image. And here, I want you to notice two things. Down here in the bottom of my computer, um, I see my little downloads option here. And then here, this is the important stuff right here. This is the attribution. So they have conveniently given me a little copy button. Okay, it's on my clipboard. So if I go back over to my PowerPoint, we'll see how it looks. I'm going to turn off my little buttons here and I'm going to just paste it. Control V on a PC. Oh my gosh, that just looks horrible. And you go, oh, now what do I do? So let's try some other alternatives. What's another way to paste? Just plain old text, right? Ugh, this looks terrible. So can I just paste it as um, text itself? Some agencies allow you to do that, some don't. In this case, I would go in here and I, instead of using that copy button, I would just try to grab this and we'll see if that works. Once you do this a couple of times, you then know, oh, huh, that worked out much better than that silly old copy button. That copy button was really for a web page. But now these tell me exactly, so if I put my, um, you probably can't read it, but this tells me that Marianne Grimm is at pixabay.com users, and it tells me and gives me her name, and then it tells me over here uh, that this is from Bix Pixabay, and it would link me right out to it. So now when I put my image in, right, I'm going to go up here to my, oh, my little toolbar just gets in the way and I want to insert my picture, I'm going to go to where? My downloads folder, right? And I should find my little polar bear right there. I'm going to insert it and I'm going to position it. Maybe I'm going to take this text and put it right underneath it. But now what I've done, come on, give me my little thing here, is I have adhered to um, good manners and I'm using the image and I'm providing anybody else who wants to use this presentation with title. Well, they didn't have a title on this one. It just says image. You know, she could have named it Polar Bear. Um, author and then the license. It's a Pixabay license. What other Photoshop, uh, photo um, sources might you use where you would look for images? Does anybody have any others other than Pixabay? Or how do we find for inf how do we find those licenses? Um, Thomas, your question: What is the advantage of going through OER to go rather than going to the original site if the original is more up to date? That has to do with how you plan to use the materials. Um, 
looking at open educational resources in that context, it is really nice if you're dealing with a situation that you have no connectivity or very little connectivity, you can put that in that information, those learning resources on a thumb drive and give it to the learners and they could finish their work if they're, you know, out in the back toolie somewhere cutting hay or whatever. So it is, um, it is something that is, um, the OER to go is definitely a picture, a snapshot in time, which is really good when you have remote learning taking place, meaning people may not have good connectivity. I would have no hesitation if I was wanting to read or uh, wanting to do reading, maybe taking that um, fantastic phonics module and putting it on a UB USB drive and then sending it via snail mail to my student and then calling them on the phone and saying, okay, Sally student, I want you to put this in your computer and we're going to walk through lesson one and they might need help because this is low literacy I get it but you you have these alternatives of depending on how your what your use case is how you um, create and use the materials or use other people's materials and um, provide those to your students so um, Guillermo I'd like to have students read a novel that I can use without getting in trouble um, have you ever heard of the Gutenberg projects this is again Guillermo, you've got lots of options here. And this is an old site with old books. They have 60,000 free ebooks here. Okay. You can get them in EPUB and Kindle format. You can download them or read them online. This is a place to explore. Um, they're trying to add more and more. And there is another one. Um, I think it might be called the Internet Archives. So, okay, Guillermo, this is one site. If you were to do an advanced search in Google um, using that option for license, you can look for free ebooks and you might be able to then find a site that allows you to drill down into lower levels like kids' books or a certain level of reading lexiles. There's lots of websites that have um, the ability to adjust the reading lexiles <clears throat> of the works. Are there sources geared toward adult learners for phonics? I believe so, because I've heard my World Possible folks talk about that um, when I was over here at this module search, because um, I was talking to Jeremy, he's the one, uh, anyway, they're talking about it, but I don't think anything is done yet. I, I think that the other one is, and, and I honestly, I've had other people look at um, Fantastic Phonics and they were okay with it. They were like, no, this isn't too kid-like. They were able to find materials that were appropriate. Beginning readers, this might be a good one. So this is also share alike. Um, high quality books in English for beginning readers. So Guillermo, this might be another one that would work, but it doesn't lend itself to phonics. It's just readers. Yes, Voice of America, Rita, that's a good one. Um, learning English, Voice of America. But again, it's not, it's not phonics, right? Um, and Penny, you say, how do you give attributions in print? That was that same thing when I was here about choose a license. I can copy this, okay, because I went through my license and I can come over to my PowerPoint and I can simply, you know, insert a new, oh, here we go insert a new slide and so if I just say text so here I've got all my information but I don't have my links and that's something that I want to keep because that's what gets me to Creative Commons and it tells me about the license etc thing I'm not getting is my URL so I would come back to my um, choose a license here and see if I can actually capture this with the URL because that's just so much easier and you meet your um, your need. I think it's going to put this way up at the top. Here we go. So now this is a better um, this is a better license because everything is linked. My this is linked to Creative Commons, and it'll tell whoever comes along how my work can be used. Right? Do all YouTube videos have identical licensing with restrictions? No. YouTube does allow authors to um, Creative Commons licensed the videos. And if you go into YouTube, which sounds like we should do that, you can find resources that are um, licensed 
in that way. You do have to be careful in that you have to have an account in order to be able to download them and use them. So if I were to search here, so I'm going to do polar bears on ice. I've got polar bears on the mind. So now I'm going to use this little filtering tool here. Okay. Many of us don't see this, this filtering tool. So I can choose when it was uploaded. Today, this week, this month, this year. Over here, I can choose the type. I can choose the duration, which is really good for learners because, you know, we don't want them having to watch long videos. What kind of features is it? And under features, you'll notice it says Creative Commons. By searching Creative Commons, I just cut down my results significantly. Now, in using these, then you can decide, you know, um, how do you want to use them in the tools in YouTube's editor you can download these videos and then you can um, cut them up um, whatever you want to do with them so there is the possibility in YouTube um, that this can be abused because some folks will put materials up in Creative Commons and um, YouTube does not have a good way of uh, kind of tracking who's using them on sites where they have implemented commercials and some users or some creators don't like that where you know you take my stuff and you post it on your site so you're drawing audiences away from my youtube channel to yours and you're making money off of it because you're using youtube's um, commercial capabilities of putting ads on these videos and things like that so you have to really read about YouTube's licensing, and you may prefer to use a different site like Vimeo. Um, there's a couple of others that I can't recall the name of now, but there's other hosting sites for videos. So that's a, that's a possibility. It, doesn't, it isn't all about YouTube, but it's very common. Um, so I'm used to citations. Where does the CC attribution go on a citation in a bibliography? If you are using content and you are using that material in your bibliography, you would put in, um, yeah, they, they can be printed, Jill, they can be printed. Um, you can put in your bibliography, um, let's say you were retrieving something off the web and it's like Penny's Polar Bears, photos used on page six, licensed Creative Commons CC BY and it's just telling those individuals in your citation or in your bibliography that's where that resource came from ideally it's also done in your book in your printed book um, but a lot of people like with powerpoint um, i don't know if you noticed like on this slide did you notice that i had it had the attribution here some people don't like to do this because it's like, ew, that's ugly. It's, I don't want them there because they take up too much space. But I am providing the information needed where you can go as an individual and find that image. So if they didn't move it. So here it is. So, I mean, I don't speak this language, but I like the image, right? And I was able to, um, and actually I found mine on Pixabay, I think, so. This is all about licensing. So this is the title, this is the author, and this is the license. This is Tassel. And it gives, there's a great resource here that says, this is how you do it. Give me the title of the thing. Give me the author who made this. Preferably link them to the page, to their profile where they did it. Where did you get it from? Give a link to the original photo. In this case, they're using Flickr. Give a link to the license itself. This is, they call it a license deed. And you have now done a wonderful job of giving attribution to this author. If it's like in PowerPoint and you don't want to put these on the page like this, I've done it in the past where I've put these credits on the final slide where it'll say, you know, uh, slide 14 conversation and I put in the information of where I got that image from because the idea is just like in a bibliography you're trying to send the reader the user whatever back to where you found your information 